Welcome to Novelist Spotlight, the podcast where published fiction writers are interviewed to gather their insights and writing lessons so we can use them to make ourselves better and more effective writers. Now, on with our program. This is my console in the spotlight as novelist and uh, university professor Jonathan D. And, uh, you know, I'm a little uh, embarrassed to say that Jonathan only recently came to my attention thanks to the New York Times Book Review which wrote a, a very, uh, very ebullient review about uh, Jonathan D. I'm going to read you the top of that review because I think it kind of summarizes uh, where this man is at at this stage of his career. So it goes like this. Jonathan D., at 60 years of age and with eight books to his credit, one of which, The Privileges, was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in 2011, should by now be regarded as, if not officially, a national treasure, then at least, and then at the very least, a natural resource, a rare bird perhaps, or a dependable supply of fresh water. Especially to his credit is the fact that he has resisted the considerable temptation, widespread among comfortably established writers, to endlessly refine, i.e. repeat a successful formula, which often seems to be what readers want and publishers, however, tacitly demand. D is a risk taker, in other words, and his restless, adventurous, at times reckless approach is nowhere more evident than in his latest roll of the dice, the taut, bare bones, not entirely user-friendly Sugar Street. The novel opens with a bravura dissection of the romance of the American interstate highway system, not the wide open liberating human river of Kerouac, but the constricting, recursive, hyper-surveilled Mobius strip of DeLillo. Well, to be spoken of in 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 terms of Don DeLillo at all is is an amazing thing. And I don't, I think you listeners know, I do so many of these podcasts, I don't have time to read my guests' novels. But in this case, I had enough lead time and the New York Times Book Re- Review did it for me. I read Sugar Street. I then read The Privileges. I plan to read uh, Jonathan D's uh, other novels as well. I've discovered a new novelist. So let me put it that way. One whose uh, sensibilities are very much in line with mine. And you also know that I rarely blandish anybody who comes on this program, but um, uh, Jonathan D., I want to welcome you, and uh, I'm really thrilled to have you on the program. Thank you, Mike. It's it's great to be here. Thanks for that introduction. Uh, my my friends have gotten a lot of mileage since it came out uh, about uh, you know uh, out of addressing me as a as a dependable supply of fresh water. <laughs> <laughs> what Most did you think? What did you think of that review? I mean, that oh, review was quite, uh, you know, I mean, it was, uh, there was quite a bit of adulation contained within that review. Sure. I mean, how can, I don't, you know, every, at this point, you know, after, after eight books, uh, reviews themselves just feel like a roll of the dice in some way, which, which is to say, like, you can't, um, you can't get too high with the good ones and you can't get too low uh, with the bad ones. But this was, uh, you know, John Ray, who wrote the, the review, uh, is himself a, an excellent novelist. So, of course, that always makes it feel especially good. Uh, exactly. You've earned the respect of somebody um, uh, who you admire yourself. So yeah, there was really nothing to do but but feel grateful for that. You know, and what was interesting to me is he he mentions Don DeLillo and it was back in 1985 when I discovered Don DeLillo through a New York Times book review, White Noise had come out. Uh, I read the review. I thought I better get my hands on a copy of this. It won the National Book Award. It turned out to be my favorite novel I'd, I'd ever read. And um and then you come along, and again, I, I should have. I pay quite quite a bit of, of attention to the literary scene, and yet I hadn't heard of you before. And there you are at Syracuse University, in my part of the world. Like I had told you before we started recording, I grew up in upstate New York, uh, and um, um, Syracuse is you know, an esteemed university, especially for the kind of program that, that you're involved in. Which I should tell our listeners, you are the head of the uh, creative writing program. At Syracuse University, uh, working with a really uh, with some a group of really esteemed colleagues there, you know, one of the things that made the point that Jonathan Ray made in that review is that you're not doing the same novel repeatedly, not looking to refine it or repeat what you've done that worked. And when I read Sugar Street and then I read The Privileges, very much uh, was exactly that message. Uh, Sugar Street was a very different novel, first person for one. Uh, just for starters, in, in third person with the privileges. Let me ask you about Sugar Street a little bit. Uh, have you ever had a bad encounter with a cop, Jonathan? <laughs> um, 
Actually, uh, no, not really. Um, I, I, and I think that's that's part partly the point. I mean, if you it's it's pretty easy to to go through sixty years of life, uh, you know, in the in the skin that I'm in, uh, living the life that I live, uh, without um, uh, that kind of encounter, which which many other people would take for granted. I can I can tell you that I mean, there's there's an episode in the book uh, where the narrator um, recalls his um, uh, his own encounter with uh, with a cop who came to his door one night, and then it turned out that that cop had earlier, uh, as a kid, had mowed his lawn. Uh, that really happened to me. So got it. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean that that was so authentic. I mean i I've, I've had a couple very minor uh, encounters with police officers. Nothing on the scale that they ever laid a hand on me. But uh, uh, there's there's that. The the it was very authentic. The attitude and uh, the way he handled the whole thing with uh, your main character there. Mm -hmm. Where do the, you know, I always resist the idea where I don't ask authors, where do your ideas come from? Because that that's a very cliche and, and a, not only a cliche question, but one that's kind of like, come on, you know, what, what am I supposed to say to that? But Sugar Street specifically may have had an origin somewhere that, that some some spark. I mean, um, what would you say in just in terms of where the the idea sprung from? Was there a, a single place? Was there a single moment? Uh, no, there, there were there were a few. Uh, there were a few ideas, you know, or half ideas that that eventually you know came together. Um, one of them, really simply, was just uh, uh, wanting uh, to write about uh, the problem of wanting to disappear from from the surveillance state to, to want, wanting to go off the grid, as people say. But uh, how would you go off the grid if you were a person who, much like myself, um, possessed absolutely no survival skills? whatsoever is usually that idea is associated with going out into the woods or something. Um, what would you do if you wanted to not uh, be for, for whatever reason, and this guy has multiple reasons, uh, to, to not be seen, uh, to not be uh, uh, located. Um, and just to think about the, the you know, the, the, the puzzle of the kind of life that that would push you into. That was one idea. Um, another uh, idea uh, was just Wanting to write about, I mean, like one of my earliest notes about the book was just that I wanted to write about somebody becoming radicalized, um, but not. There are there are many ways to do that that seem already really well worn and obvious. So I wanted to to um, to try to come up with a story that ended up there, but but not by the usual path, uh, and also, frankly, not by. I mean, it's a little bit like shooting fish in a barrel just to to invent uh, uh, in, in a contemporary setting. Um, some angry right-wing white man who goes crazy. Uh, I, you know, I wanted to do it other than that. And then, and then the final one actually goes back to what you were saying about when you were reading from the the, the Times review. I mean, I think uh, I think the reviewer gives me he, he's right about my not wanting to do the same thing every time, but he almost gives me too much credit in terms of why, uh, because it, a lot of it is just just reacting against myself at this point. A lot of it is just asking myself, well, why don't you write in the first person more? Uh, why are you, you know, what would happen if you did that? Why are you avoiding that? Why don't you try that? And that, that, that pushes me into um, uh, experiments or forcing myself into like, you know, an, an uncomfortable place uh, in order to get going on, an, on a new project. Also, the, just the, the, the third person, the kind of panoramic multi-perspective third person idea, uh, which I have often used, it didn't really seem appropriate to this moment. I mean, this, this moment seems more suited to one angry confused guy alone with the thoughts in his head and 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 just not really being released from that perspective for the for the span of the book yeah well it was uh, being first person like that it, it, that interior the interior monologue and and such it made a whole lot of sense one of the things that i didn't quite get and, it, and again for our listeners sugar street it's about a man He's committed a crime. You don't know what the crime is, but you do know it's financial. Uh, he's trying to disappear. The story begins on an interstate highway. And uh, one of the things uh, about the book is that we don't really think of the United States as a surveillance state. We think of China that way, or maybe Iran, uh, or or perhaps Russia. But the United States, what what you really brought into relief, Jonathan, is that there are a lot of cameras everywhere. And then you've got to worry about how you use, there's credit cards, there's all kinds of electronic breadcrumbs that follow us everywhere. Uh, cookies on on our browsers and uh, internet browsers and so on. 
and it's a hard thing to disappear. That's <laughs> what you find out. You have to slip into a into a um, uh, an enclave where you're kind of doing business. One of the things that that was really interesting is that he had to deal with some people who are unsavory characters themselves who knew that okay you seem like you're on the run but uh who isn't on the run in our in our the underbelly of society so i'm going to cut you a break and give you a room or uh, i'm going to sell you the car or what have you um so it, it, the, and the other thing about writing about this character in, in first person, Jonathan, it was very easy to track. You know, so often novels will have too many characters and you're trying to keep them straight. And there's these different storylines converging. And I don't necessarily read for story as much as I do for the writing and the, the vignettes, the characterization and so on. Um, the thing I didn't get about the review is... Um, his reference to a not entirely user friendly novel. Did you do you understand what he was getting at with that? Because it it seemed it seemed entirely user friendly to me. Oh well, that's good. Uh, I mean, I I I don't know. It was, yeah, it was a little confusing, but I, I think maybe he was just saying, uh, and and you know, this is a note that I have often gotten not only about this book but about other books that that I've written is that the um, the central characters themselves um, don't feel like somebody that you would necessarily want to be friends with in real life. Yeah. Yeah, uh, exactly. So, no, not maybe not user friendly uh, uh in that sense. Um but that's okay. I'm I'm I, I wasn't under any uh, delusions about that. Right, right. So you teach the craft uh but before actually before we even get into that, uh, when did you start writing? Uh, well, I mean, there's, it depends on, uh, on how you want to define it, I guess. I, uh, uh, it's, it, I, I wanted to be, I wanted to be a writer from me from a very young age. Um, sometimes when I was, uh, when I was little, I remember, uh, this is in retrospect, kind of a tell, but, um, I would read books, uh, and, and at that age, they were mostly books about sports. And if I, if I particularly liked it, I would grab one of my father's pencils and legal pads and just try to rewrite it from memory uh, as if it were my idea. <laughs> um, so, so there was a lot of, there was, you know, fantasizing about being a writer and about being a part of that world, just the, the world of, of books uh, um, and, and readers. Um, but there's wanting to be a writer and then there's actually wanting to write something. And I don't think I, I really did that or thought about that until probably, you know, um, senior year of high school. Um, I had a teacher who, uh, who, who allowed me to, to, you know, do a kind of independent project where, where I, I tried, I made my first attempts at doing that. Um, then in, in, in college, I think the really formative influence uh, uh, in terms of, you know, like I say, wanting to, to get from just a vague fantasy about being a writer to actually wanting to do it uh, was a professor there named John Hersey, who, a name you might know, who wrote Hiroshima and, and many, many other books. Mm -hmm. um, and I had, uh, I had him as a teacher in his very last semester before retirement and he was you know um he was a famous guy uh at that point he was certainly the only teacher i ever had that my parents had ever heard of but he was a huge influence on me in every way and in fact a lot of what i still do in the classroom uh is just stolen from him <laughs> you know i had a, a professor of russian literature on uh several months ago i was asking him about why have the russian great novelists and the great novels stood the test of time and uh, in addition to, to talking about because they, de they deal with the biggest questions in life and their timeless questions, he also said the novel has always occupied a place in Russia and Russian society that uh, has never it's never achieved in, in the United States. It's never been as central here in the United States. What do you see as the, the, the novel's place in, in U.S. culture or maybe Western culture uh, these days, Can, especially considering that people have far more entertainment options today than they did in the past uh well yeah that's that's certainly true i mean i, I uh, it's 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 true uh that that the novels never occupied the place in american society or american culture that it that it uh did or does in russia but it's also true that the you know there are a lot more options now and the no the novel doesn't occupy the place in american culture that it did a uh, 100 years ago so i i think that uh, um uh you know, you've mentioned uh, DeLillo a couple of times and, and um, one of my, he's a very quotable guy, but one of my favorite uh, DeLillo quotes is, it was suggested to him in an interview um, that the novel was dead. 
And he said he actually rather liked the idea that the novel was dead because that turned him into a ghost with all of a ghost's privileges, <laughs> which is, a, you know, a good way that, to look that's, at it. I, yes. I think, you know, if you're, if, you're, if you're if you're able to decenter yourself and your and your sense of your art in that way, um, then you feel uh, uh, you know it becomes more personal. It becomes more eccentric. You feel less of a responsibility to to others or responsibility to represent anything other than your own particular worldview. So um, you know, literary fiction is becoming more and more uh, of a of a uh, a niche. Um, in the world of entertainment, but from my perspective, that's okay. You know, it, it, uh, it it's, it's, it's liberating, um, uh, in a way. You know, I read and I listen to a lot of novels and I got to say that every once in a while you find this happened with James Salter, for, for example, where, when you're reading him, it just seems that every word, every sentence is very carefully chosen. A lot of thought goes into it. The writing is paramount. And that's truly how I felt with with your book, with with Sugar Street and with the privileges that there is a carefulness to word selection, phrasing, and, and so on. Where the if you look at the book business, the fiction business broadly, it tends to be really heavy on plot. It's about telling the story, and maybe I'm not telling it the in the most elo eloquent fashion or picking the most accurate words. But I'm getting the story done. And for a lot of people, that's just enough. And I don't mean the writer, but I mean for a lot of readers, because uh, the biggest selling books don't tend to be high literature. Uh, but it does appear that you um, are, are very careful about your sentence construction, the words you pick, the phrasing you use. Um, and that's aside from just you know the, the characters you're creating and, and, and all uh, what is your writing process like? I mean, it, it it would seem that when a person's being that judicious about each word, it could be a very laborious process. I don't know if it feels that way to you or not. Uh, well, first of all, you can't imagine how uh, how, how chuffed I am to to be compared to James Salter uh, in any way. Um, you know, he's one of my favorite writers, and and I, in fact, way back when my whole my whole first novel, uh, which I you know. Uh, uh, when I look back on it now, it really it was just a, a, a really unsuccessful attempt to sound like James Salter, um, uh, because yeah, he's a um, uh, just a just a brilliant, uh, uh, inimitable writer. But um, I, I think that uh, I mean, yeah, thank you for that. I mean, I, I I'm, I'm very happy to hear that. I, I think like uh, part of the answer is just uh, involved in the move from third to first person. I think that uh, uh, it changed things for me because I, I really had I had written first person sections of books before. I'd only written one first person novel before, and that was quite a long time ago. Uh, so the sense of a character having to create himself via his narration, um, you know, made made the attention to the sentences different. And also, part of the part of the conceit uh, of Sugar Street is that um, uh, it's it's almost like a it's almost like a real time narration. I mean, it, he he doesn't uh, um, it it really exists only um, in his head. It's deeply interior, and and so just the the uh, that that sense of having an overarching narrator that that might have been present in the privileges or the locals or or one of those books, um, uh, a sense of of something a little bit more mediated and, and remote uh, in the style uh, that had to go away. Um, but I, your, your, your question is about method. And yeah, it does take me, I, I'm always shocked how long it takes me uh, to, to write a book. And I also, um, I know this is very uh, old school, but um, I write the first draft of uh, any work of fiction that uh, I'm, I'm writing uh, longhand, um, which is really, uh, uh, I, I think it's taken a long time for me to figure out like why that's important or what that does, but it is really important in that in that initial stage, uh, that kind of trance state that you're in when you're inventing something, seeing something imaginary for the first time. Um, it makes a difference um, to uh, uh, to be writing it. Yeah, and then I mean that adds an enormous amount of time to the process because after I write it, no one can read my writing, so I have to then uh, you know type it in uh, to something myself and then print it out and edit it on paper and type it in again and and before you know it, a few years have gone by. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, the the careful word selection and sentence construction I saw just as much in the privileges as in Sugar Street, but uh, nonetheless, you, the, here you are writing first person in Sugar Street, 
Uh, are you of the mind now that you want to write more uh, books in first person or, or all future books in, in first person? How, how do you kind of make that decision? You had mentioned how you made it for Sugar Street, but then going forward, what are they, what's the calculation between first and third person or even second person, which is rare, but. I think, uh, you know, it, it comes, uh, it, it, it comes from the idea. The, 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 the idea will, will dictate to you uh, the form in which it needs to be told. There's, you know, um, uh, the locals wouldn't really have been viable as a, uh, as a first person book, um, except that it has, if, if, you, if you ever read it, you'll see that it has, a, it has an extended prologue that's in the first person. And then both that voice and that character uh, never return. But um, it's 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 mostly that it's mostly that that inseparable from the idea uh, that that you have um, or or following you know almost immediately behind it is a sense of of the form uh, in, in which it, it would best be told. It's mostly that, and it's partly uh, like I say, just a kind of um, self uh, uh, interrogation about. Um, you know, what I did last time and why I did it and, you know, what would happen if you did something else. Uh, I can actually, you know, I can, I can propel myself a long way just on that kind of um, uh, self-recrimination really, but <laughs> like, well, why did you do this? Uh, so yeah, uh, that'll, that'll determine it next time. So how do you teach the craft? You're at Syracuse University, uh, you teach creative writing, you've got a classroom full of what graduate students or you teach undergrads as well uh, how do you so I mean if they're graduate students are obviously very committed to the writing process so how do you teach the craft how do you teach a person to write creatively yeah uh, well I teach both here and uh, now which is new for me I mean previous I, when I when I took the job here which was about six or seven years ago now I'd never taught undergrads before but now it's about half and half um, so it's different you, it's right as you say I mean the the, the, the graduate students who are here um, you know, they're, it's a, it's a very selective program. They're here for three years. They have really, they really want to consecrate their life to this. So, uh, it, it is not hard to motivate them, uh, at all. And, and I think like more and more, I, I, I think it's less about, uh, what you teach them, um, more about the kind of space that you create for them. And to just try to try to create, you know, in, in real life, uh, as I know, I didn't, I didn't go to an MFA program. And, uh, so, uh, the, the idea that you have, time set aside uh, and, you know, they don't pay any tuition here and they get a stipend on top of that time, just, you know, time to answer the question, how good could I be at this if I really devoted myself to it? And it's an opportunity that you don't get in real life and they probably won't get it again after they, they leave here, but uh, just to, um, to be surrounded by people who care about the things that they care about, to have smart, constructive, supportive people to read what they're doing and point out where the strengths and weaknesses of it are. Uh, I think it's much more about that than about my, my teaching them how to write. It's just a sort of showing them um, what's, what's working and what's not, allowing them space to experiment, talking about what's most original in their work and what's not. Uh, and then of course also there's, um, uh, we don't just sit around and read each other's writing. Uh, we, we read a, um, a ton of, uh, of great books uh, as well. And, and again, just talk about that in a way that a regular English class wouldn't talk about them, talk about them in terms of craft, in terms of, of uh, uh, authorial choices, uh, in terms of, of the history of, of one's own art, which I think is really important to know, even if it's important to know because um, you, uh, you, you wanna reject it or, or, or rewrite it. Uh, so those are the grads. The undergrads are a little different. I mean, they're, they're um, they're, they're very smart and, and surprisingly good readers and writers, but they also have other stuff they're interested in and, and, and that's okay. And it's just about, uh, so it's, 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 a, it's a little bit of a different vibe uh, with them. So in best case scenarios, um, you see a student whose talent really starts to bloom in a bigger way over the course of the semester. Um, what do you observe in terms of um, just the development that you see. Is it, is it common for you to see that a student evolve a great deal or are there certain star students that just you see them really kind of get their wings? Well, both, uh, uh, they really do. I mean, it's, uh, uh, you almost can't help but um, uh, get better uh, over time if, if you get to spend three years in, in, in that way. But then there are some people um, who just have a, a, a breakthrough uh, while they're here. And um, 
and, and it's not like we sit around on the faculty and congratulate ourselves for that. It's really more of a feeling like we had nothing to do with that, but I'm glad that we could at least, you know, create the space where, uh, where, where that could happen. Um, you know, I had uh, uh, a writer here a few years ago uh, named Nana Ajit Brenya, uh, who went on to a great success. Uh, another named Anthony So, um, who alas, uh, died just before his first book came out, but um, also just a, just a genius student. Uh, we have a student named Monica Brashears who has a, a, a novel called House of Cotton coming out in April. Um, and uh, uh, it's, you know, for, for, for all those people we were, when, when I read applications, uh, which I'm about to do again uh, for next year, um, that's in some ways, you know, arguably like the most important part of my job because it's really, a, you know, you're, you're reading hundreds and hundreds. We take six people a year and we probably have, you know, 500 applications for those spots and all of them are pretty good, but you're, you're just listening. You're just listening for a voice. You're just listening for a voice that belongs to somebody out there who's like, I have this, I, I have this interest and, and I have this talent and I want to pursue it, but I don't really know what to do. I just need somebody, I need some stranger to hear me, you know? And so to be able to call somebody up and say, yeah, we actually, we hear that and we'd like you to come here for a few years. Um, that's a great feeling. So your department at Syracuse has a, a you know star lineup of faculty members. You got George Saunders there and Mary Carr and Bruce Smith, you know, in addition to yourself, mm -hmm. how much interaction and strategizing transpires between you and uh, your fellow faculty members and, and what is the nature of that interaction or is it every man and woman for themselves is it is it the sort of thing where everybody teaches their own program when you guys do talk it's not about what uh what the program is going to look like any individual class is going to look like uh what what do you guys really bring us uh kind of in inside the ivory tower so to speak <laughs> and, and what uh what you guys uh, spend your time talking about in terms of, of curriculum and dealing with the students? We, we talk about the students uh, a lot, uh, really. I mean, I've, I've, I've taught at other places uh, that, that uh, were more like you described there where, where it's, uh, you know, I would just show up and teach my class and go back home and it didn't really feel uh, communal in that way. But partly because this program is so small, um, we, uh, we, we, we talk about, um, the, the the students and about the program uh, quite a bit. Um, and I'll, I'll I'll mention a couple of the other faculty members here: uh, Mona Awad, who wrote Bunny, and and uh, Chanel Benz. And the um, uh, the other member of the fiction faculty is uh, Dana Spiota, um, who is not only a, a, a brilliant esteemed novelist, but also my wife. So um, so we 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 talk about the students a lot. <laughs> um, you know, uh, it, we uh, we work together. Uh, yes, it's, it, it would be very hard not to. Uh, we have that in common. But the, um, uh, you know, like I say, six fiction students and six poets uh, a year, uh, a very small faculty. Um, we talk to each other about uh, the courses that that um, uh, that that we're worried about or that we're you know trying to revise or to invent. Uh, we talk a lot about the progress of individual students, and we do really sit around um, and and talk about how individual students are coming in terms of that breakthrough that we were talking about. Like uh, we, could, we, we sort of pass them on to each other in a way. I, I, I'll teach them in a workshop, you know, one year and then the year after that, it'll be Dana and the year after that, it'll be George. Um, so so we, we follow their progress that way. And I should say too that, that the, um, the tone setter uh, in all of this uh, is George, who, um, who isn't, even though he's not here full time anymore, he's very much here and, and uh, very much, um, uh, sets the tone in terms of his personal generosity toward, you know, uh, from colleague to colleague, from, from faculty to student, everything. He's just a very, um, everything you've heard about him is true. He's, he's, he's uh, unfailingly generous with his time uh, and, and, and very invested um, in everybody's success, uh, faculty and, and students alike. And if, if George were here, he would say, well, that's because when I got here, Toby Wolf was here. And Toby Wolf would say, well, that's because I, when I got here, you know, Raymond Carver was here. But there's a, there's a long history here of, of that kind of, um, uh, you know, non-competitive, non-selfish uh, communal energy. So what compels you to write? Uh, or are you compelled to write? Do you consider yourself a, a person who really needs to write because it's it's just a part of your fiber it's it's part of the breathing process or is it something that you choose to do because it's a um, it's a fruitful activity 
I, th I think you have to feel uh, that way about it, that you that really you have no choice but to do it. It's something that you're compelled to do because, you know, for um, it, it's it's not a life that's full of, of material rewards all the time. I mean, it's not uh, uh, if the, one of my favorite quotes about about writing, which I um, I often bring up to my students, even though they, they wish I wouldn't, is from uh, uh, the late Robert Stone, who, who said that the, the reason writing is so hard is that nobody cares if you do it or not. <laughs> and uh which is true and you mm -hmm. find you get out of school you really find out how true it is so i write because i mean you know i i wanted to to become a writer because it was there was just nothing else when i was whatever age 18 20 25 there was just nothing else that i cared about as much and and honestly like at that point in my life all my plans were really predicated on the idea that i would fail um i just thought well uh, you know very few people make it as a writer, so I probably won't either, but I at least have to try. Because if I don't try, then, then I'll be mad at myself my whole life. But if I try and fail, then I can move on to something else. Um, and uh, uh, so the, yeah, the, the, the fact that it, that it worked out and continues to work out uh, is just an incredible um, bit of, of good fortune as far as I'm concerned. I mean, I can, the idea that I can still spend my working life doing what I most like doing uh, and thinking about what I most like thinking about um, is, uh, uh, I, I'm sure I could have done something else with my life that would have been uh, less stressful or more lucrative or whatever, but um, it doesn't matter. I mean, I think like anybody, uh, uh, anybody my age or my, my stage of career or whatever would, would probably say the same thing, which is that, you know, I, I, uh, I do it because I just, I, I feel like I, you know, if, if not like I absolutely have to, then at a minimum, like there's just nothing else that I care about as much. So what, what is the ideation process like when you've decided I'm going to write a novel and I have a premise? Um, where and how does that happen? I mean, are you a meditator? Uh, do you meditate on a core idea uh, for the novel? Do you take walks? Do you scribble notes? Is there any consistency or ritual to the process once you you? Because um, I don't think you I don't think you are an outliner, right? You you start with a an idea and maybe an ending, and then you let the writing reveal itself, kind of the, an organic process. Is that right? Well, uh, that's a really good question, and you've kind of you know you've you've stumbled onto the great uh, you know journey of like my writing life, uh, it, which is that I started out as a compulsive outliner, um, I, and I think a lot of that was. Um, some of that was because time, you know, when I was working on my first book and I had a full-time job and I was you know, living with roommates, et cetera, time was very precious. And so the idea that I would write a scene or a chapter and then it would be no good and I would have to throw it out, that felt like a catastrophe uh, to me. So I outlined everything uh, compulsively and planned everything and really stuck to the plan. And I think that's, you know, that showed up uh, in my in my first couple of books. Uh, they, they felt a bit like that. They felt like you know, the footsteps were there before the characters walked in them. So the thing that I've learned over, over my writing life, um, which I'm very conscious of now, uh, is I, I do, as you say, there is a period where I'm, I'm writing notes on napkins where I'll frequently send emails to myself uh, that are like two words long. And sometimes I can't understand what they are when I, when I open them. But there, there's that, you know, that, that meditating, that, that, that phase that I think most writers know at the very beginning of a project where it feels like the whole world is speaking to you in some slightly deranged way. But then I used to wait until that was over and then try to kind of plan everything out. Uh, now I'm very conscious of making myself sit down and start before I know, before I feel ready, before I know where I'm going. And, and I, you know, I do often have an ending in mind. Um, at least half the time I wind up, um, you know, uh, revising that ending. Uh, but, but more important, I have a beginning in mind. I have often, it presents itself in terms of an opening scene or an opening chapter. The Privileges is like that, uh, uh, Sugar Street was like that. Um, but making myself start before I feel comfortable, before I feel ready, and that means that I write a lot more bad pages, uh, but I just have learned that that's not, that's not failure, that's process, you know, and, and, and I think the result I get out of it is better. Well, when you uh, talk, talk a little bit about the organic process of writing versus the outline in terms of your own, well, the, the, the result of it, uh, your own productivity or the quality of what you produce, do you, do you feel that you're untethered when you allow yourself to, to uh, engage in the organic process rather than, than outlining the whole thing and uh, that brings you creative benefits? 
Uh, yeah, yeah, I get, untethered is, is a good word because, um, uh, because one of the problems, at least for me, I mean, I know that some, some fantastic novels get written in exactly the way that I'm, that I'm, uh, I'm discarded here. So it's not, the problem is not the process. The problem is that when I wrote an outline, I, uh, I would panic if it seemed like things were drifting away from the outline. So if there's no outline there, then you can just follow things where they go. And like I say, it doesn't always come out great. Uh, very frequently it does not, but, um, but you know, you can write um, uh, without really knowing much about a scene or where you want it to go. You can write it and it can come out to four pages and three and a half of those pages can be lousy, but then there's something in there that you, you, know, that you, you didn't have before you started that came to you while you were, while you were inventing. Um, and that then becomes the, the kernel of trying it again. I think the danger is, um, and I say this because I've experienced it myself, is uh, when you don't have an outline, kind of writing yourself into a corner to where mm -hmm. it's kind of like, I, I, I feel like I've trapped myself. Have you had that experience? Or uh, maybe I just wasn't uh, uh, of an age yet where I would just take pages and throw them out and, and, and uh, give it a fresh run. I don't know. But well, I, I'm I, curious whether that's happened to, to you or you, you've seen it with other people as well. Sure. No, it happens all the time. I, uh, I, I think you're, you know, you're right though, that, that the, the breakthrough, at least for me, was not feeling, you know, like I was in a corner just because I'd written something that, that uh, I couldn't figure out how to get out of or that I didn't like. It's just, you know, to, to then, you know, go back to, um, to go back to the point in the draft where you felt things started to go wrong uh, and start again from there. Um, that's all. There's a lot of starting again. Uh, I mean, not in terms of the whole book, but in terms of, of sections of the book. Um, that that now I just you know, like I say, it's just it just seems like a matter of course to me now. And and uh, um, when I was much younger, uh, I would have experienced that as a as a crisis. But now it doesn't really feel like that. How were you notified that you were a finalist for the Pulitzer uh, for the privileges, and and how did the process move forward from there? Because very few people have been engaged in that process. So how did you get word that you were a finalist? And then, and then what happened after that? Well, uh, not much the, because the, uh, the, the Pulitzer is, is unlike, I think pretty much any other prize uh, like this in, in, in the book world or, you know, movie or TV or, or any world in that there's no, um, there's no short list. There's no like uh, announcement of nominees or finalists and then the winner. You literally find out that you're a finalist at the same moment you find out you didn't win. Uh, so there's, there, you're not notified of anything. There's a, one day every year at a, at, a, uh, at a specified day and time, uh, the Pulitzer board announces all the prize winners in all the categories. And when they announce the winners, they also announce the finalists, usually there are two. So, uh, so I had no, I mean, I'm, I'm glad of this in retrospect that I didn't get a month or two months to be, you know, Pulitzer nominated <laughs> sit around and, and, and yeah. fantasize about how my life would change if I won or anything like that. I didn't, I didn't have that at all. So it's probably good. So um, the other thing that made it good is that just by chance, the, the, my co-finalist and the winner that year, uh, Chang Ray Lee and Jennifer Egan are both very good friends of mine. So it, it felt like, um, it felt like a, a fun day in, in, in every way. Um, and uh, so Jennifer won it that year for the goon squad, a visit from yeah. the goon squad. Is that right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Definitely a celebrated novel. Uh, and I remember I heard her on the radio and they were talking about the writing process. And she said, well, I come up with an idea for the chapter and I write a first draft. And, and of course it's terrible. <laughs> and, um, you know, one of the, it, it just reinforced what I had read many years ago in bird by bird by Anne Lamott that look, everybody writes a shitty first draft. So get over it. <laughs> look at all the look at all the writers that you most admire. They write shitty first drafts and then they go to work on it. Yeah. Um, yeah is, is, only, what, what about that? Do you concur? Oh, absolutely. And not only is it a matter of just like getting over it, but it's it's kind of the sometimes the shittiness of, of my first draft or second or third is kind of motivating because, like you, you know, there's um, uh, you know, it's bad. And then, you you know, you want to kind of leave it alone for a while. But then there's a part of me that just keeps thinking like it's right over there in the other room, just being terrible. And I, I can't live with that. Like, what if I, what if I go outside and get hit by a bus and somebody finds it, you know what I mean? Like they're going to read it. I gotta, I, I you know, uh, I can't wait to get back to work tomorrow so I can, I can um, shed myself of the anxiety I feel uh, at how, how bad this project is. So 
getting a bad first draft into the world, it, it you know, can actually be like, um, it can be motivating. Yeah. And I bet it kills off a lot of writers that they sit down. I think there's a lot of people who think I've got a book in me and they're not necessarily dedicated writers in terms of they know this is what I want to do with my life, but they sit down and they find out just how exacting a process it is. And when you do produce that first uh, lousy draft, if you can even get that far, I don't even, I'm not convinced people even get that far. A lot of the time they, um, they just say, I just, either no good at this or it's too torturous i it's just uh too too uh i have to carry this around with me all day thinking about how badly i did and i don't see a way out of it now those obviously are not the people who um early in life i remember campbell black uh the late author campbell black who said he was just a little kid and he heard dylan thomas uh reading on the radio and he the thought that came to him is that's for me and he spent the rest of his life writing yeah. And it was that it was that um that that simple when you're working on a book jonathan do you have several other ideas in mind uh, uh, not for that book but i mean do you have ideas for several more novels that you kind of you know evaluate and then you make a decision on what you're going to work on or are you uh, the kind of person who you come up with an idea for a novel but you, but you don't have a list of other potential novels sitting in wait? Uh, no, I don't. Um, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm the kind of person who has a, you know, a, an idea roughly once every four years. That's how I feel about it. <laughs> um, so, uh, and, and if I, if other things uh, occur to me that I'm interested in while I'm in the early stages of working on something, I, then I, I feel like that's a sign, you know, there's a reason you're thinking about things at the same time. And I, and I might try to incorporate it into what I'm doing. Uh, but I haven't had I think the last time I really felt like I had a sort of, you know, uh, air traffic control situation going on in terms of, of great ideas for fiction um, was probably when I was, you know, uh, in my 20s and didn't know any better. Uh, now I just feel grateful when I get, you know, a decent idea uh, at all. Maybe, maybe, the, maybe it's just that I've learned to tell a good idea from a bad one. But um, uh, yeah, no, I, I, I'm, I, I'm, a, I'm a one idea guy. Well, do you keep writing even when you don't have a novel in mind? Do you uh, continue to experiment or play with fiction? Or do you not sit down and write each day unless you're working on a project? Yeah, that's it. I mean, when I, uh, there's, a, there's a fallow period, you know, between uh, books. It's not like I finish one novel, you know, again, after whatever, three or four or five years, and then the next day, pick up the, the pad and start another one. Um, so... There are times when I'm not writing or, or more often like just doing other kinds of writing, uh, you know, writing criticism uh, or, 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 you know, magazine work or things like that. But it is very important uh, when I'm working on a book. Um, I've tried everything in terms of, uh, you know, word counts, page counts, uh, 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 amount of time spent at the desk, uh, whatever, in, in terms of establishing routine. And, and really uh, what I've, where I've landed is, the important thing is just to, just to do it every day. And some days go great and some days are lousy. Uh, some days you might have something else going on and you can, you know, you can only sit down with it for like 45 minutes or an hour. Um, but I try not to beat myself up about that because the, the important thing in terms of, of uh, uh, you know, discipline and also in terms of making sure that you're still connected to the idea itself, to the fictional world itself, is just the everydayness of it. Uh, other, other goals are artificial and are just there mostly to, to, so I can make myself feel bad. So who do you write for? And I want to ask you this question in the context of what Larry, Larry Y. Woody uh, used to say is the proper way to write a novel. He said, you, needed, you need to write for one person. It might be a family member. It might be a friend. It might be your spouse. But when, the, when you're writing, you should have a singular person in mind who you're writing it for and that's how an authentic novel comes out and he believed that i i connected with him very late in his life and and he still stood by that uh prescription now obviously not not everybody uh writes that way but uh who do you write for when you're writing are you thinking in terms of an audience are you writing for the, uh, your own personal satisfaction are you targeting a particular uh, specific person? Uh, no, I don't. I don't uh, think so. I mean, I think like you know, uh, earlier in my career, I thought much more 
while I was working about what people would think about, uh, you know, whether that's in the abstract or, or specific people would think about what I was doing. Um, and I still, it's not as though I don't care. I mean, I care very much whether or not people like what I do, but, but when I'm working at this point, I just feel like, you know, you only, um, you only get so many at bats, you know, I mean, uh, it's, uh, I've written now eight novels in about, uh, 35 years and, and, uh, I just, it's just me and the work and the idea of what's good. I just want to write something good. Uh, that's really all. That's the only feeling I have when I'm working. Is mm -hmm. like, you know, I'm not going to get that many more chances to really write something good. Um, and then, you know, like I say, when that's over, then it's a different story. Then, then, then uh, you're showing it to people and, and, I, and I do care what they think about it and what they say and, I, and I'll act on advice, etc. But, but yeah, to be truthful about it, like when I'm, when I'm really engaged with it, it's just, you know, me and the work and, and the idea of a, of a standard that that's, you know, ultimately just, just mine. I mean, my, my first reader uh, these days is, is Dana, my, my wife, and I'm, I'm hers too. Um, so maybe maybe on some level that's on my mind, knowing that when I feel like something is good enough to show, that she'll be the one to see it. Um, but uh, but again, that's that that's not that that's afterwards. So give us a criticism or two that Dana leveled on you during the writing of Sugar Street. <laughs> um, well, Dana is, you know, is, is a, a brilliant writer and a great reader. And, and she also, I mean, one of the reasons why um, uh, our, our life together works, you know, to, to novelists living in, in the same house is that we know what to say to each other and when. So if I show her anything really early on, she's smart enough to know that I just need to be encouraged and told that it's great and I should keep going. Uh, then, you know, uh, later when I show her the whole thing, I'm trying to remember what she... Uh, um, uh, suggestions that she had for, I'm not sure I can even remember anymore, but she gave me, she, you know, she gave me very uh, extensive notes um, about individual scenes or lines in it. Um, she's a, she's a person who she's a very, very careful sentence writer. So she's a big help in that respect too. Mm. Um, uh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, if she were here, I'd ask her, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, I know I can't think of anything offhand, anything specific. Um, so knowing what you know now, you're about my age. I mean, you're, you're, I think, 60 years old, maybe 61 years old, uh, Jonathan. So if you, uh, knowing what you know now, if you could go back in time and talk to uh, your 20, the 25-year-old Jonathan D., what would you um, tell him in terms of advice, whether it's writing or life advice? Hmm. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, life advice is a whole uh, separate category. But, but, um, but in terms of writing, I mean, I, I just think like, you know, again, when I was um, when I was that age, uh, I really was. Just, I, I assumed, not in a kind of self-hating way, but just in what I thought was a practical way, I assumed that it wasn't going to work out for me. Uh, and, um, and and I, you know, I just wanted to kind of give it a try first. Um, so if I, I, the thing I would say if I could go back is just I would say like, you know what? I mean, it's going to be okay. Uh, it's going to be like you're. When when I think now about the fact that it has worked out to the degree that it's worked out and and i um uh i'm still writing books and and you know people are still publishing them and 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 reading them uh and that i got to spend my my whole life this way i mean 60 seemed pretty distant when i was 25 right so i would mm -hmm. just i would just say like you know relax take it easy just don't stress out think more about the writing itself than about you know the the, the panic over whether or not um it's you know to what degree it's going to be successful because um, it's gonna be fine. It's a it's a marathon, not a sprint, and uh, uh, you know you, you should relax. That's mm -hmm. what, I would mm -hmm. what is the um, not an easy question, but the most influential book you've ever read? What it doesn't, and, and maybe it's a nonfiction book uh, that that kind oh. of sets you on a path or whatever. Wow. Um, Was there one that propelled you in a way that maybe others didn't? Uh, there, I mean, there have been a few. There have been a few books that have been really, you know, the the, the John Dos Passos uh, USA trilogy was it was a huge uh, influence on me. Still is. Uh, Madame Bovary was a huge influence on me. Uh, um, James Salter's The Sport and the Pastime was a big influence on me. Maybe not in a good way, because like I say, I spent years trying to write like that, and I can't. <laughs> um, but I think like the real answer. This might sound a little hokey, but it's really true. Uh, it it goes back way further than that. Um, to uh, to when I was in. Um, uh, the equivalent of junior high. Uh, and I would, um, 
I knew where the desks in the study hall were that belonged to older kids. And I had already read through, you know, back then you'd have like, there was English, which was a class about grammar basically. And then there was reading, which was where the good stuff was. So I knew where the reading textbooks were for the older kids. And I'd already gone through mine. And uh, uh, I was like reading, you know, maybe in like sixth or seventh grade, trying to read the ninth grade reading book. And um, I came across a story uh, by a writer named C.D.B. Bryan. Uh, the story was called So Much Unfairness of Things. And um, I must have read that story 20 times, just over and over, because um, it was a, it's a short story about a kid um, at a, a kind of strict, uh, like a sort of military prep school. Um, his father went there, his grandfather went there, the kid is there, and the kid is in danger of flunking out. And he has, uh, he has a Latin final. And um, in, a, in a moment of, of weakness and, and, and fear and panic about what will happen if he flunks out, he cheats on the exam. And um, his roommate, because the school has an honor code, his roommate and best friend tearfully turns him in. He gets expelled. And his father comes and picks him up from school and takes him home. And the, and the, the reason that I, I couldn't get over this is I, I felt like, for once, I felt like I didn't understand it uh, because I didn't understand how I was supposed to feel about everybody. I didn't, like, I felt... I got to the end of the story and I was like, wait a minute, I feel sorry for everyone. And that can't be right because, you know, all the, all the lessons I've been taught up to now are about like, this is, this is the moral that you're supposed to draw from this story. So that the, you know, I don't know when the epiphany came exactly, but when I realized that like that was actually not, you know, uh, not a bug, but a feature, as they say, that that was what the story was supposed to do, what it was trying to do, kind of complicate my feelings and make me not judge people. Um, you know, that was like, uh, that was a huge breakthrough for me, like, you know, at the time as a reader, as opposed to a writer. But, um, but I think I still think about that story a lot, although I would never go back and read it now, because, you know, it's probably terrible. Uh, but I, I don't want to spoil my, my image of it. But I, I remember that vividly. Right. Interesting. So let's say you're organizing a dinner party, uh, which three literary figures, dead or alive, would you want at the table with you? <laughs> um, Hmm. Let me see. Uh, well, I, I, I'd, I'd invite Dos Passos if I could get early Dos Passos because he became, um, you know, like uh, he was, a, he was a very radical guy in the in the twenties and thirties, and then uh, like a lot of disaffected uh, uh, socialists and communists in in this country, um, went way over to the other side and became uh, just a kind of horrible reactionary late in life. So if I could get like you know. 1935 dos pasos that would be good um and uh i wouldn't i i'd invite uh john hersey because i you know i want i would want him to see uh what an influence he had on me and that i and that i made good um and then probably the third would you know would be dana because i, I wouldn't want to uh, uh, i would want to have an experience like that if i couldn't talk about it with her afterwards so Right, right. And you might even want her to cook the meal. She's probably a better cook than you are, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, no, I think if it, if it came to that, we'd. Uh, if I was going to have a dinner like that, I'd have it catered so nobody had to spend any time in the kitchen. <laughs> there you go. Um, so are you at work now on something new? Just barely. Um, I, I'm, I'm in that that process we were talking about before where I, I have a lot of, I have a little, lot of little notes, uh, a lot of little uh, emails to myself, uh, uh, a lot of um, books I'm reading for research purposes, or, you know, of course, the internet is like, is the, uh, the ultimate rabbit hole in terms of, uh, of, you know, re I don't even know if you can call it research because like, you know, you, I, I can and have spent hours pursuing some idea that I thought was a good idea and turned out not to be, and you know, like hours have gone by, and you know, all you've been doing is just uh, um, just browsing. So that's where I am now. I, I haven't, I have an idea, um, uh, but in terms of actual prose, I haven't written a word. What keeps you from being a more um, frequent writer, more prolific writer, just in terms of, of of numbers? Because if you, it doesn't seem that you would have difficulty really coming up with an idea. Although maybe I'm underestimating just how careful you are about, about that, that process and, and, and how much it needs to, to, to resonate with you. But it does seem that, and I realize you have, you have a, a, a big job to begin with, a big daytime job to begin with, but is there anything that you would consider an impediment to being uh, even more productive? 
I mean, sure, but I don't want to blame it on that. I think it's it's mostly just. I mean, I wish I were faster. I, I, I absolutely wish that that uh, I were more uh, productive. Um, but everybody's got their own pace, you know. I mean, I, I don't. Uh, uh, at this point, I feel like the, there's enough evidence that this is how long it takes me that I'll just accept that this is how long it takes me. So. Uh, it's partly that, and it's partly that you know, uh, real life intrudes. I mean, um, I do, uh, I do have a job uh, that you know is um, uh, it, it's it's a it's a fairly big demand on my time. Uh, it took me um, it took me eight years to write the privileges, but that's not because it took me eight years to write the privileges. It's because there was a lot of other stuff going on in my life at that time. I was a stay at home father, etc. So you know, it's it's a combination of just uh, personal um, uh, idiosyncrasy uh, and, and the fact that um, you know real life intrudes uh, sometimes, whether you want it to or not. I know that you uh, have said that you've been reminded that most of your readers are women; uh, that women read more fiction than men. Uh, why do you think that's the case? That there's so many that women are so much more inclined to read novels than men are. Any any thoughts about that? Any theories? I don't know. I mean, I was just uh, I, I've seen statistics, uh, uh, you know, uh, compiled by publishers that that suggest that, and and I know that like a lot of writers, I've had discussions, you know, with publishers about where they they want to, you know, if they're picking a cover, for instance, that they want to discuss whether or not it appeals to 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 women. Um, I, I really I, I couldn't I couldn't hazard a guess uh, you know, why that is. Um, if I, and, and, yeah, anything I said would just. Um, would just be potentially sexist guesswork. So I think I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll just I'll just accept that as a fact and not try to interpret it. Yeah. Okay. Well, the um, I have to tell you that my wife and I have very different reading. Um, she reads stuff that's very different. I've recommended some books to her over the years. I think you really like this, and then she uh, I, I just don't see anything in it. Uh, but Sugar Street, I said, yeah, I really think you're gonna you'd like this book. You should give it a try and check it out and she really this was one of the, those very few books that she said yeah i really like that book oh, she said the only the her only issue was that she said i felt like the ending was rushed that that it came to a conclusion quickly did you have any sense as you were writing it that you thought um it wrapped up a little too quickly which is very common with novels anyway i mean it seems like that's uh, uh, something many authors do but did you execute the ending as intended or, well, obviously you did as intended, but did you have any sense that, that uh, there was a little bit of a rush to the finale? I didn't get that sense myself, but my wife did. I'm just curious. Well, no, I mean, I, I uh, um, uh, if I, if I thought it was rushed, I would have gone back and done it again. But I, I, but I, I, I guess there were, uh, uh, there's a couple of things going on there. One is that, that uh, things happen fast at the end but I think of that as being because of what the character is going through. I mean, there's there's suddenly very much there's a there's a, a ticking clock for him that that there wasn't uh, until really just like a few pages earlier, and I and I did think too. Um, I mean, I always wanted the novel to be short. Uh, I always envisioned it as as being short, um, in part because, you know, um, as you know, this this guy's project involves scaling down his life pretty radically. I mean, he moves into a room in somebody's house and he spends most of his time there. And I don't think you really want to tax the reader's patience with that for, you know, 500 pages because, I mean, I did try to think of ways to make it suspenseful, uh, but still it's not, it's not inherently uh, 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 suspenseful. So, so I was trying to keep it down to a certain length. Maybe that, mm -hmm. uh, maybe that's, that's, that's part of the equation. Um, but uh but yeah, it I, is it, a compact novel, and that that's uh, that I appreciate it as well. And and uh, you covered the territory, um, you know, thoroughly, and didn't and did not. Um, I didn't think anything got to be okay. Let's move on. It was it was very well paced and all that. It sure seems like a book that there could be some Hollywood interest in. I mean, I, I can envision Billy Bob Thornton be there being a vehicle for a guy like Billy Bob Thornton. Yeah. Um, has there been any um, any uh, interest from Hollywood? I know the book is still fairly new, though. Yeah, uh, yeah, there has been. Um, it's uh, um, it, 
I don't know. I, I, I've been down this road before, like 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 every writer. So I don't expect uh, that much will come of it. But but there's there's at least one. Uh, my agent is talking to at least one producer who has uh, ideas about it, and and that happens, um, you know, almost every time. I mean, I probably don't realize that that um, Hollywood um, buys up a lot of of books. Uh, yeah, I sometimes I get the feeling that they're doing it largely just to keep other people from buying them up. Uh, <laughs> and the, per the percentage of those the books that get optioned that actually get made into something uh, is very small. And, and I think like uh, you know most of my books have been optioned. Um, only one of them got really close, like close enough that I read a screenplay uh, for it. But it, but that's okay. You know, that's okay. I, I don't. Um, uh, uh, I feel like that's you know in a way, option money uh, from from movie or TV world is is just like free money for a fiction writer because you already did the work and they just, they, they you know, um, they're just, they just want to reserve the right to do something with it if they want to. So it seems, it seems, you know, churlish to complain about it. As you were writing uh, your character, who in the review he kept calling X since he, the character was unnamed, mm -hmm. um, did you have, uh, how visual is your writing just in terms of the character that you're, you're writing? Here's this lead character, the narrator, how clear a picture did you have of who this person was visually? Oh, pretty clear. Uh, you know, I think it, it kind of, um, uh, I, I don't, I don't really necessarily need that right when I start, but it, but it, you know, it becomes clearer as you, as you inhabit, uh, you know, this guy's, this guy's perspective, his consciousness, uh, uh, long enough, there's no opportunity really to describe him in the book because it's a first person book. And also he's, um, you know, unhealthily obsessed with, uh, with not giving away any identifying details. But, um, uh, but yeah, I could, I could see him, I could see Autumn, I can, you know, I can, I can see pretty much everybody in there. Interesting. So, um, well, dare I ask if Lightning was, was to strike and they not only option it, but they decide we're going to go into production. Who would you want to see playing that role? Who, who would fit your vision? Are you willing to say that? I, I know that writers can be superstitious. Um, yeah, yeah, I, uh, I don't, I really haven't thought about it. I, um, uh, I saw somebody else wrote somewhere that they thought the character of Autumn should be played by Allison Janney. And, and I thought like, Oh that yeah. Little, yeah. I could see yeah. that. Out for um, sure. But uh, I mean, Billy Bob Thornton is a good suggestion. I'll, uh, I, I, my worry about, you know, about that is that he, he already looks like a guy who has been living like that. You know what I mean? And, and that's I, true. Yeah. Good point. Um, and maybe a little older than than you want the character to be. I'm not sure. But, I think uh, I, I pictured the character, in, you know, in his in his 40s or or maybe you know 50. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Well, I have to tell you that um, that book was a discovery for me. You've been a discovery for me. I've read two of your books uh, uh, now, and I have six more on deck, obviously. And uh, we'll look forward to you producing some new stuff down the road, Jonathan. I really appreciate you taking the time. I know you're a busy guy. And uh, thank you for um, coming on the program and, and sharing a bit of yourself. Well, thank you for, for inviting me. It's been a pleasure.